Ladies and gentlemen, it's very, uh, I'm very pleased to be here again, as I said, uh, to be and meet uh, all uh, the, the uh, colleagues and uh, esteemed uh, colleagues from, uh, from India, from UK, from Israel, from everywhere. Dr. Palchekter, I haven't seen her for some time, but it's great to see her. Now, um, my contribution this afternoon is about the evidence-based diagnosis and measurement of poor responders. I was speaking in the other room, so I didn't know exactly what happened here, but uh, so my, maybe some of the work uh, will, will be a, a recapitulation. So uh, again, uh, um, assisted reproduction is now a fact, hmm? and uh, more and more babies are being born, five million babies now, and we were very pleased to celebrate the 30th of IVF in Alexandria with Professor uh, Edwards the late Professor Edwards. But of course, uh, it is not 100% uh, success. We know that uh, these are the, some of the results of the uh, uh, Society of Assisted Production uh, Technology. And as you can see, roughly, the results at that time. Because you see, this is published 2007 for the results in 2001. I think there is a, a, a more recent analysis. But anyway, it's roughly one in three. If we repeat it, it's roughly two in three. If we repeat it three times, the results are about two in three. But across the board, of course, in all centers, if you take all centers together. Uh, so it doesn't succeed every time. And the reasons of success may be poor response to ovulation. It may be in the fertilization step, in plantation step, or in being an experiment. But my contribution today is about poor response. But what is poor response? Now, this is a paper by Sari and Schoolcraft since 2000. And they said at that time that the big problem is that we don't have a definition. And for them, they said, first of all, that poor responders not only produce fewer follicles, but also fewer oocytes then, lower fertilization rate, low implantation rate, low clinical pregnancy rate, and finally, low ongoing pregnancy rate, and probably low live birth rate. And they said that there were at least 27 definitions at that time. So uh, anyway, the etiology was, uh, nobody knows exactly what the etiology, but age plays a role, of quality, abnormal receptors, uh, antibodies, and all these theories have been done. But the definitions were at least, as I said, at least 27 definitions they reviewed at that time. They said some people say poor responders are those who have a lower number of follicles who are developing. Uh, some said, no, it's the number of oocytes we retrieve. Some said it's the level of estradiol we reach. Uh, some say the peak is as old we reach, serum is on day three or day five. Uh, high daily uh, doses, we, use, uh, we have to use more than uh, uh, six samples a day. Uh, total HMG, we have to use more than 3,000 units, prolonged HMG, cancer cycle. So there was always a need for a definition because even those who use follicles, some use two follicles as their cutoff points, some use three, some use four, some use five. And those who use the number of oocytes you recruit, some say three, some say four, some say six, some say the day of HMG, as I say. So we looked at this problem in 2005, and we published a paper. Uh, now, this paper was, was not exactly rejected by, by fertility and sterility, but it was said to, you know, to, to, to cut it short and, and so on, so we published somewhere else. Anyway, for us at that time, we said, now, if your success rate is 30% when you obtain five, four oocytes, and if it is 30% if you obtain 10 oocytes, so why do you want to obtain 10 oocytes? If it's four oocytes, it's as good as 10 oocytes. But if you, if, you, if you go down to three oocytes and then your success rate goes down to 15%, then this must be the cutoff point. So it must be the number of oocytes we collect, which will diminish our success rate significantly. This is what, after the, towards it, an object definition is, clinic, as clinical pregnancy is the aim of assisted production, or probably we should say live birth rate, the definition of poor responders should be based on the number of oocytes retrieved below which the clinical pregnancy is significantly significant. And we looked at our patients at that time. We took, I think the total was 754 patients done on that year. And we correlated the number of oocytes retrieved and the clinical pregnancy rate. We could, what we do, evidence-based medicine, we were told the best way of evaluating a prospective um, a test is to do ROC curves, 
receive an operating characteristic curve, which we did. First of all, of course, there is a good um, correlation between the number of sets. The more sets you collect, the more success you get. But this was not the question. The question was to, to, to construct the, the ROC curve. And by doing this, we find that our cutoff point was uh, five, if you are talking about ICSI patients. Because again, if your ICSI success is better than in IVF success, so the poor response definition will be different. You know, if you get, if, if you can do, get your, your best results by obtaining five oocytes in ICSI patients, maybe in IVF patients you need more. Uh, are you talking about patients who are having uh, uh, TESA because they have uh, um, obstructive vasospermia or because they are having non-obstructive non -obstructive vasospermia? Again, it must change with the indication. And this is what we have obtained at that time. And so we, uh, uh, our conclusion was that the definition of poor responders uh, is related to the procedure performed, and that should be defined as those from whom less than six, seven, and nine oocytes are received when performing ICSI, IVF, and TESA ICSI, respectively. This is what we said. Then came the ASHRI consensus. The first thing that the ASHRI consensus said, if you go back to the paper, is that they were the first people to look at this problem, which was not really true. I, but I wrote them a, a letter which they, uh, they tried to... Uh, to do it, but anyway, and it was published, the letter, and, and, and so on. But the problem with the definition is that it is not evidence-based. They said that, okay, the definition, two of the following three, advanced maternal age, 40 years. Who said 40 years? How did they reach 40 years? Why is it not 37 or 38? A previous uh, poor response, three, uh, number of four, three or so. Why is it three? Why not four? Why not five? How did you obtain this number? Abnormal ovarian reserve. Anti follicle count five to seven, an anti uh, antibiotic hormone. First of all, this is not the cutoff point. This is range, and this is the range. I don't know, but Ashri is Ashri. Everybody has to obey, because you see, we we we, we published this. We we did another study actually for the whole uh, uh, lot of patients we had with six thousand five hundred, and we found that again the cutoff point was the the, the years for us at least. It was thirty. If you Starting from 31 years of age, that many people in epidemiology will tell you, the, in the, the fertility of the, of, of the woman starts to diminish. Uh, it may be a wrong number, but at least this was done in an, in, in an evidence-based uh, no. Anyway, so, this is, so there will always be the problem of uh, the uh, definition. My advice is that Ashley should uh, collect the database from the whole of Europe, for example, which I have, then construct the constructive uh, uh, ROC curves and look at the cutoff point of uh, anti hormone, look at the cutoff point of age, and look at the cutoff point of, uh, of a number of oocytes, and then come up with a definition. Yeah. Anyway, because we know that how do you predict? Again, it's all based on the definition. If you don't have a definition, you cannot compare things. Anyway, people have said, how do you predict? You do day three FSH or day five anyway, or high basal E2 or H AMH or enter follicle count. And again, these are the static tests, but there are also dynamic tests that people used to use in the past. Clomiphene challenge test. You give clomiphene, you measure estradiol at the beginning, and you measure after clomiphene, and you see if it is increasing or not. Lupron, E2 response to FSH. You give FSH, you see if it is increasing or not. GNC. These are all suggestions that people have suggested. But of course, it ends up that there are two ways of, of, um, of, uh, of uh, predicting uh, poor response. The first one, of course, is antifolical count. And as you can see, this is an average response. This is a poor response. This is uh, an advanced response. And this is based on the uh, paper of Q, uh, Qui Italia, who did random uh, receiver operating characteristic curves. And of course, if you're talking about poor response, this is one end of the spectrum. Because on the other hand, you have the hyper responders. So you really need to have two cutoff points. There's a cutoff point below which the results are going to be bad, and there is a cutoff point above which people will develop ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And for them, it was six. Huh? So, so this was the cutoff point for antifolical uh, count, and um, uh, the other one was 15, but it, uh, it's not mentioned here. Uh, the other uh, paper, this, uh, there are a few papers now. One of them was from Elgindi, from, uh, from Egypt actually. And again, she looked at anti mullerian hormones. She, she, she did the receiver operating uh, characteristic curve, and she came up with 2.7 nanogram per milliliter as the cutoff point. The good work was done also by Brewer, and the, he did the right thing. He compared it to two techniques to see this is how you compare the tests. Huh? You don't sit there and say, I'm. Um, 
a big boss, I am, I've decided that it's going to be this and that. So for, for in, uh, based on this study, and uh, both, uh, uh, both tests are good under follicle count. You see, you know, people who are familiar with receiver operating curves, um, this area under the curve uh, is roughly uh, the, your, uh, how your test can predict properly. Huh? So the, the higher the area under the curve, the better the predictive value. So under follicle count was good, but anti-amylin hormone was slightly better. If you're talking about ovarian hyperstimulation, antral follicle count is slightly better than anti uh, hormone. But these bo uh, two are good. So, all right. So, um, notwithstanding this problem with the definition, let's look at what is, what is the management of correspondence. What did people suggest? Some people suggest that we do, should do something with the gonadotrophins. We should increase the dose, we should diminish the dose. Some people said, no, we should play around with the aggressive. Some people said, no, maybe we should use antagonist protocols. People said, no, we should go back to natural cycles. People said that we should add natural adjuvant therapy, like growth hormone or whatever. And finally, people said, maybe we should change the DF transfer. Let's look at things, and by doing this, let's do it based on evidence. You know, the level A is when there is a randomized controlled trial or a meta-national randomized trial. Level B, if there is a trial, but not randomized. Level C, if it's the expert opinion, no trials. Go down the trophies. What do people do? Some people said maybe we should increase the dose. Maybe we should only use recombinant FSH. Maybe we should add recombinant LH to recombinant FSH. Or maybe we should start FSH in the previous cycle, huh? in the late phase of the previous cycle. Now, first thing, increasing the dose. Should we increase the dose? Short answer is no. It doesn't make much difference. These are case control trials, randomized control trial, no difference in the mean number of retrieved oocytes. Again, cancellation rate, no much difference. Uh, what is important is the pregnancy rate. Pregnancy rate, this is a case control trial, but of course we always look for the randomized trial. Randomized trial said no, and two case control trials said no. If you increase the dose, you are wasting your time. You are not getting more pregnancies. Okay, second thing, should we use recombinant FSH only? Now, Raja Italia produced this. So it was the, the mean number of, of retrieval sites was more if you re use rec uh, recombinant FSH. But we are more interested in the live birth rate. So the pregnancy per embryo transfer was not the, was was the same. So again, recombinant FSH does not seem to be doing the trick. Uh, and again, here's another one. Uh, this is uh, this is the uh, 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 the oocytes receives, as I said, maybe maybe the oocytes receives, but the pregnancy rate is not. The third suggestion was to use recombinant LH in addition to recombinant FSH. For example, using Pergovaris, as you know, it's 150 units of FSH with 75 units of LH. And uh, to cut a long story short, this is the, the meta-analysis which was done uh, uh, some time ago. It didn't see, show much difference, but um, uh, uh, Mokhtar Italia showed that the clinical pregnancy rate, again, when they did it, did, know, uh, did not uh, show much difference if you're talking about the agonist protocols. Huh? Again, the ongoing pregnancy rate, no difference if you're talking about the agonist protocols. Again, the live birth rate was no different if you're talking about agonist protocols. Um, again, uh, adverse effects, no difference. But if you're talking about an antagonist protocol, uh, again, no difference. Uh, uh, no difference in ongoing pregnancy rate, no difference in adverse effect. But if you're talking about, if you take only the poor responders and give them this treatment, yes, you increase the result. The ongoing pregnancy rate was 1.85. So it seems, yes, this is the first thing that seems to be working based on evidence. Hmm? The three studies by Ferrarati, De Placido, and Beraneca, as you can see here, the point, if you do this with poor response, agonist protocol, and you, in, you, you add recombinant LH, use Pergovaris, yes, it seems to be increasing your ongoing pregnancy rate. Another study is on advanced age, which is another form of poor response. Huh? Again, the clinical pregnancy was in, in, increased and the implantation rate was increased. So this is the first thing that seems to be working. Now, what about starting FSH in the late luteal phase of the previous cycle? Uh, it doesn't work. Mm. Again, OSAT receive no difference and no word about the pregnancy rate. The second strategy is to play around with the agonists. Maybe we should diminish the amount of agonists. Maybe we should diminish the dose of agonists. Maybe we should stop once we realize that the patient is not responding well, we stop altogether. 
So this is the flare-up protocol. Hmm? The, to, to, to do a short, uh, you know, the flare-up protocol, the, the ultra-short protocol. You only give for three um, uh, days in order to take the, the flare-up uh, advantage of the agonist. And by doing this, again, number of retrieval of sites, uh, some said yes, some said no. Cancellation rate, uh, some say yes, you, you maybe diminish your, success, your cancellation rate if you use the flare-up protocol. But what is important is the pregnancy rate, really. And most of the study said there is no uh, difference. So this only this study showed some difference. But if you're talking, but no randomized control study anyway for this flare-up protocol in poor responders. Maybe uh, somebody can do this to give us the answer on the pregnancy rate. What about diminishing the dose? Uh, giving a smaller dose, a mini dose instead of the mega dose. Again, clinical pregnancy, this is a randomized control trial by Weissman and Italia. Clinical pregnancy rate, no change. Ongoing pregnancy rate, no change. Um, what about the stop protocol? If you're talking about the mean number of uh, oocytes, some said yes, some said no. Cancellation rate, some said yes, some said no. But what is important is the pregnancy rate, no change in the pregnancy rate, two randomized control trials, so it doesn't seem to be doing the trick, this stop protocol. And again, this is the stop versus not stop uh, meta-analysis by Kiro Italia, showing no difference. Okay, what about the antagonists? Should we give antagonists by single dose or the multiple dose? Uh, there are two, are you talking about antagonists versus the long protocol, or are you talking about antagonists versus the short protocol? Now, antagonists versus the long protocol, again, retrieve oocytes, some said it increases, some said it doesn't increase. The random mass control site said with antagonists, you maybe you increase the number of oocytes, you diminish your cancellation rate, but what is important is the pregnancy rate. Two random mass control trials and three case control trials saying no, you do not uh, uh, improve your pregnancy rate. So again, uh, uh, if you're talking comparing antagonists versus the long protocol, it doesn't seem to give much difference. And again, uh, maybe the days of simulation are going to be lower, but the OSAT retrieve are not to, to, uh, going to change, and the clinical pregnancy rate is not going to change by giving. Now, this is the antagonist, sorry. Now, we, uh, the, this is antagonist versus the uh, long protocol again. What about versus the short protocol? Again, this is the clinical pregnancy rate, no change. Huh? In poor body response, clinical pregnancy rate, there was no change in the result. So antagonists do not seem to be doing the trick again. What about natural cycles? People were said, well, we should do natural cycle, or modified natural cycle. Natural cycle plus uh, the antagonist. And again, as you can see here, um, uh, the um, natural cycle uh, versus, uh, uh, versus uh, agonist and antagonist protocols, again, the, if you're talking about the implantation rate, no change, and the pregnancy rate, no change. Um, natural cycle versus flare-up protocol, uh, versus the short protocol, again, pregnancy rate, no change. Pregnancy protocol, no change. Pregnancy per cycle, no change. So again, natural cycles do not seem to be doing the trick. What about adjuvant therapy? Various things, growth hormone, from the tree, the hydroepinosone survey, uh, the hydroependosterone, transdermal trans testosterone, low dose aspirin, letrozole, L-arginine, paridostogamine. Now, growth hormone, does it work? Short answer is yes. This is the live birth rate, the work coming from Israel mainly, and then this is the Kiro meta-analysis showing yes, you increase your success by five-fold actually. And it is, this is the live birth rate. So growth hormone, yes, if you can afford it. It is very expensive, of course. And this is again the Cochrane view saying yes, the live birth rate is increased and certainly the clinical pregnancy rate if you give the growth hormone. Uh, uh, versus placebo, and again, another, uh, uh, the rest of the Cochrane review, the clinical pregnancy rate, as I said, and the live birth rate, as I said, is increased by fivefold. People said, okay, growth hormone is okay. There is also the growth hormone releasing factor, which comes from the hypothalamus. Maybe we should give it. Anyway, it didn't work. Uh, biochemical pregnancy, clinical pregnancy, live birth rate in this randomized control trial by house. Uh, the second uh, <coughs> adjuvant, giving clomiphenicitrate, adding clomiphenicitrate to our recombinant uh, uh, protocol of, with antagonists. This is a work by Damato Italia. It didn't work. It doesn't seem that adding clomiphenicitrate to HMG uh, makes any difference. The other thing, the hydroepiandosterone sulfate, as, uh, the hydroepiandosterone, as we heard now, was suggested, was used, but again, uh, uh, again, the meta-analysis showed that it does not work. But 
pre-treatment was transdermal trans testosterone, as we said, it does work. This was um, a paper by Balash et al. And again, showing here that the number of follicles is increased and so on, the pregnancy rate in this paper did not change. But when the meta-analysis came after that, the pre-treatment with testosterone showed uh, uh, that it increases the, the clinical pregnancy rate and it increases the live rate as we uh, heard a few minutes ago. So yes, testosterone is another thing <coughs> that seems to be working. Brilliant. Aspirin, does it work? No change. All sides, embryos, pregnancy rate, birth rate, no change. Lodos, again, another study, no change. So aspirin does not seem to be working. What about letrozole? Again, in terms of pregnancy, no change. This is a randomized study by Goswami Italia. It not change. And this is the meta-analysis by Bosto Italia, showing again a meta-analysis, no, uh, uh, no change if you are adding letrozole. What about arginine? Again, clinical pregnancy, no change. What about paridus pigmine? Ongoing pregnancy, clinical pregnancy rate does not change. And finally, the date of transfer. Does it make a difference? This is a study by Bacetti et al. from Turkey, showing here that if you put your embryos day two, is better than putting your embryos day three. The clinical pregnancy rates are increased. The, clin the ongoing pregnancy rates are increased. Is this because you, um, is this because your com uh, incubator is not working very well until day three or what? But anyway, this is the result of the study. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, 10% of IVF patients respond poorly. The definition of poor responders depends on the technique and expertise. In our experience, it was so and so. Antrophological count and AMH are the best predictors of any response. Four approaches have been shown by evidence to be of benefit. The use of growth hormone, adding recombinant LH to recombinant FSH, pretreatment to testosterone, and day two versus day three. But of course, more studies are needed, randomized studies, to determine the best regimen for managing poor responders. With this, I come to the end of my presentation, and I would like to thank you very much for it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Salam. You, we can Pando. always rely on you to give us uh, a, a reliable and unbiased opinion, on spe especially when it comes to complex matters in the field. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Um, wanted to know your opinion regarding minimal stimulation uh, protocol uh, for poor responders. Called, uh, mild stimulation, or mild protocol, uh, since uh, we already know nothing works as far as the protocols are concerned. Yeah. Uh, don't you think minimal stimulation would be more uh, patient friendly? Yeah, of course. I mean, the mild stimulation is, is, is going to be patient friendly. I, I, um, I'm a strong admirer of the mild stimulation protocol. I follow the work of Gita Nargund and other people, of course, working in the field. Um, but um, this question is, is it good for poor responders? I don't know of any randomized study that showed that it is good for poor responders, unless you know of something you should tell me. Do you, do you, is there any study? No, I'm not saying yeah. it would be better. But then the cost per uh, pregnancy would certainly... Yeah, I know, be. but you see, we are talking about poor responders. We are talking about poor responders. I mean, if you are talking about in general, yes, a, a mild stimulation protocol may be uh, good and will save money. And certainly in my country, uh, money is very important. Patients pay for every single thing that we, they do in IVF. It's not like Sweden or even in Israel, uh, where, where patients are, uh, are, 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 you know, they, they have everything paid until they get two children, right? Until you get two children, the government pay even, even if they do 20 times. So in our case, it's, it's very important, the price. But talking about poor responders, I don't think it makes a difference. Thank you. Thanks. Then if you were to use it just at the yes. beginning of it. I see. And the problem with that is it's expensive. <laughs> just yeah. you're talking about cost. Yeah. Everything is cost. Yeah. So it's much more expensive than DHEA. And if you're going to yeah. use that for three months yeah. before you start the IVF cycle, that considerably adds to the cost of the cycle as opposed to just using it in conjunction. And that's where when we try to not follow what people have done and just try to cut corners, it doesn't always end up with the same results. Yeah. So you know, if we do it in conjunction, some patients it may benefit and some not, but are we serving the patient better by doing that or should we sort of tell them that they should use it three months and save money perhaps yeah. to get the absolutely right yeah. way? We are talking, you know, so as I showed you, even if you didn't do any of this, and if you use, use a conventional protocol, these poor responders, anywhere from zero to 14%. So for the patient, you know, the patient can have nothing. It depends upon the paper you look at. But up to 14% chance of pregnancy afterwards. So therein lies the difficulty when you say, oh, you know, unless you have randomized trials, then when you look at these retrospective studies, that's yeah. the biggest problem. 
you can't rely on the data to say this is far better. And meta-analysis, again, as I said, when you, you rely on meta-analysis, but meta-analysis is only as good as the studies that went into it. And if they have poor studies to go in in the first place, then you unfortunately have poor data to look at afterwards. So at the moment, I don't think that we have the right answer. But reliable evidence, as we have it right now, is in favor of testosterone if you use it ahead of time and not in conjunction and not in favor of DHEA. Can I ask something? And what, what, what is the rationale behind giving testosterone? I so mean, is it to convert them into polycystic ovary syndrome? Dr. Kunjuma then get a great talk on exactly what the rationale is. I'll give it to you. You will speak now? No, no, I already no, talked. I'm sorry, I was speaking the other side. I didn't. Yeah. yeah. It adds on the primordial follicles. It's what? It adds on the primor primary follicles, primordial follicles, and it synergizes the effect of FSH. I see. Yeah. yeah. That is the effect of androgens. Yeah. You know, Has coming back to the uh, question about testosterone. Uh, there was a recent meta-analysis. I know we all have our uh, reservations about meta-analysis, and uh, you're right in saying that oh, it's as good as the studies that have been included in the meta-analysis. But regarding your testosterone, it was the patches and the gels that were used in all those three studies which showed an increased rate in, the, in terms of their uh, live birth rates as well, not just a clinical pregnancy rate. And the patch and the doses that they're talking about is really 20 micrograms per kg body weight, which comes up to approximately, you know, upwards of 1.2 milligrams. They also used the gel. But with the gel, you have a 1% uh, composition, and in, based on that, they're looking at about approximately 2.5 milligrams. Mm -hmm. So those are the studies, and that's the doses that they were looking at. But the duration that they used it was varying. It went up to somewhere between 21 days before the cycle started, and the latest was approximately five days before the next cycle. So anywhere, and this is the pretreatment, not in conjunctions during the stimulation. Yes, thank you very much. Sir, it's my personal opinion that the evidence, late, latest evidence that we're seeing in support of LH for poor responders, for example, the latest meta-analysis by Lehert, claiming almost 30% more clinical pregnancy rates with LH supplementation, could be acting by the same mechanism at which testosterone is acting, basically increasing the androgens that are precursors for the follicular development. No, I don't, uh, I, I didn't get all the question. Uh, I believe that LH could be acting at the same pathway that testosterone is yeah. to increase the pregnancy rates. Yeah, I, of course, I mean, we, we know the LH stimulates the, uh, the, the production of androgens and then the androgens uh, uh, go to the... So logically cell. speaking, it so, makes sense. But that the androgens are not testosterone really, it's mainly androstenedione. So maybe, I, maybe testosterone is, is converted. The but I, thing as Dr. Bhavan is saying, DHA is probably too weak to we, make any significant yeah. impact, and testo testosterone is stronger, we know that. So yeah. probably that's where the difference lies. Yeah, I think the other thing that people didn't, uh, uh, I, I don't know, it's just uh, an idea. You need people who have an high anti hormone have a very high response. So why can't we give them anti hormone? Maybe they can increase the response, right? <laughs> Huh? Uh, that's right. It's a, ah, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, which is first, yeah. Anyway. Ten of ten percent of the patients may probably benefit from these yeah. adjuvants. I think it's very, very important. We should not lose track of the fact that, oh, we've got these poor responders and we've got all these adjuvants and we're treating them. The egg donation should be kept at the back of the mind because eventually, 80, 85 percent of the patients do land up with egg donation. So I think it's very important to yeah. underline that also. Yeah. Thank you very much. But we don't have egg donations in my country, see? Oh, okay. oh. Send them to us. Send them to yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll certainly do. <laughs> we'll do that. Oh my God. Yeah. But can I um, ask the people here, you know, I'm seeing a lot of young patients with low AMH. Uh, is everybody facing that? We are seeing a lot of patients with low poor ovarian reserve. You know, the antral follicle count is also low and low AMH. I don't know. Um, I, um, I, I, the the anti-molar hormone, of course, there was a problem about the, the, uh, the kit itself and the way the they measure an anti hormone. So I personally don't depend on the anti hormone very much. No, but I, 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 I like to do what I, I do, the enter follicle count. I think I can judge it much better. And, you know, when I was young, I did a, 
a PhD in reproductive biochemistry. So I was doing all these hormones. And you know, when you do them yourself, you know that things are not that easy. See, people are talking about the elevation of progesterone. Is it 1.5 nanograms per milliliter, or is it 1.3? You know very well, you do it in two different laboratories. You do it twice in the same laboratory, and once it is 1.4, and once it is 1.6. And the clinicians who do not do these things by their hands, they take these, these numbers for granted. And of course, the, what, the way I was, I was taught is that you do the, the standard curve in triplicates, and you do the sample in duplicates. But I haven't seen any laboratory in my country who does it in duplicate because it increases the price. And people just take it for granted that this is the result. And then they start making papers and making, uh, th this, is, this is why I always, I'm always suspicious about this. Does this increase of progesterone by half nanogram before, on the day of HCG, does it make much difference? But this is a different story. So your talk was pretty much a mirror image. I think people here would agree of what I presented. So I feel Thank you very really much. vindicated I'm and sorry, it was I fantastic it. That giving me we four both talks gave in one the day. same <laughs> message except for two significant uh, <laughs> point of departures. <laughs> one was, you know, even though you stated just now that you prefer to use AFC than yes. AMH, but you showed the ROC curve that showed the AMH was better than AFC. Slightly. Slightly, yes. But as I was showing uh, a review that said the otherwise, that AFC is better and AMH yeah. is closely yeah. follows. So I think somewhere the truth lies in between somewhere. And the second part is the LH. I did not have the time to show all of LH data. I just don't spoke, uh, speak as fast as you do. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I took but longer to make my presentation. <laughs> but the LH, you were in favor of recombinant LH uh, having some positive effect in these patients. And the papers that I have show the opposite, that you know, the recombinant LH also does not have any role in poor responders in increasing the response. Again, it all depends on what papers this we pull out. This is not my work. You know, this is, you know, uh, this is the, uh, what I found in the literature, I must that say. I agree, and uh, mine too. So, yeah. so it is just those two significant points of departure. Otherwise, we pretty much echoed each other yeah. in what we said. So, nice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, just one more thing. Yeah. I, I'm glad you showed us, uh, or at least reminded us, about the grades of evidence. Yeah. Uh, and that is yeah. quite important. Yes. And it worries me, I'm going to digress a little bit here, because it worries me because when the new NICE guidelines were created in the U United Kingdom for intrauterine insemination, they described the evidence as weak. And yet they managed to make a policy which simply said, do not do IUI under any circumstance, yeah. which I find it astonishing. Now, we, yesterday I presented data from our own clinic which matches IVF data on, on an IUI program, yeah. you know. And, of course, I'm, I've been writing to the Department of Health and I'm taking things up with, the, uh, with NICE themselves because there's so many conflict of issues which should never have occurred. And this is where I wanted to seek your advice on w whether if evidence is described as weak, can it lead to a policy change based on a weak evidence? It's declared to be weak. <laughs> yeah, of course, I mean... Uh, um, I mean, I'm as, not like, as they say in French, la raison du plus fort est toujours la meilleure. You know, st if, you're, if you're strong, you impose your, uh, your, your policy. <laughs> No, but, uh, but, but I agree with you. I mean, you, you know the work of, uh, of um, the B Belgian work from uh, Genk. Genk. Uh, Omelette. Uh, the, uh, the on on in intrauterine insemination, he has a lot of work like you, yes, uh, like omelet you see. Yes, Omelette. Uh, yeah. uh, omelette, yeah, yeah, of course. Willem yeah. Omelette. Yeah. The, the work, I mean, uh, uh, it, uh, people... Yeah. Don't you know? Try to do IY anymore. I, I mean, I must say, uh, I admire the system in the United Kingdom because there's often a safety net when of these sort of considerations are done. But here, the safety net was removed altogether yeah. because one person on the panel yeah. had an overriding view, yeah. personal view, as to what that they had 